Hey there. Turns out that there's a lot of things that you can do with computers, and even more when you network them all together. However, there are a lot of conflicting forces at play, and two of the most evil ones are complexity and simplicity. Computers and networking is an absurd and complicated affair. The complexity has to exist somewhere, and if you reject it, it'll only make things worse down the line when the complexity catches up with you. This is just a fact of life, and it boils down to the trade-offs you want to make with your implementation details, just like security. And as a result of this, if you want to host some internal facing services for your home, company, or community, you need to set up DNS records for every service with annoying to configure tools like Nginx or HeyProxy, or you have to make people memorize arbitrary numbers. And the reason for this boils down to a fundamental Unix restriction that we've always had to live with. At a shipyard, each labeled spot can only have one ship in that spot. In the same way, you can only have one program bind to a port. You need to set up a load balancer that uses DNS names or SSL certificates or other factors to figure out where to point things. And because it's current year, that load balancer also has to generate HTTPS certificates, and it's a mess if you have to wire up everything manually. Ask me how I know. So if this is done poorly, you get statements like, use port 69 for GitLab, or use port 420 for the wiki, or, oh, just go clone this Terraform config to set up a new service, uh, set up a new AWS box for that service, and other statements dreamed up by the utterly deranged. So how can we make things simple again? What is the middle path between these two extremes of pain? Well, given the fact we're at a tail scale event, you might see where I'm going here. I am going to blatantly shill my employer and explain how you can get rid of all of this badness by embedding tail scale into your services so that you can use tail scale to do your service discovery, IP addressing, identity management, and HTTPS certificates instead of having to rip your hair out doing it yourself. As the nice person with the mic said, I'm Z ISO. I'm the Archmage of Infrastructure at Tailscale, and I've been using it personally and professionally for some odd two and a half years. I've also seen and committed many networking crimes beyond your feeble mortal imagination, and have since been figuring out a path towards atonement, and uh, hopefully this will suffice. When I made the slides for this talk, this is the number of the devices that are in my husband and I's tailnet. It's safe to say we're heavy users of Tailscale, and it's made things so much simpler when we just want to share things, especially because I travel so much. Part of the reason that there's so many devices in our Tailnet is because of the heavy use of TSNet to embed Tailscale as a library in our Go programs. We use 14 separate CS TSNet services for a bunch of different things. TSNet is a library that takes all of the networking goodness of Tailscale and packages it up into a library that you can import into Go programs. This lets your services get their own IP addresses, DNS names, HTTPS certificates, and access restrictions via normal ACL tags. Today, I'm gonna run over my largest success stories with TSNet so that I can give you bad ideas, or scratch that, the good kind of bad ideas to push your tail net device count above mine, which would make my employer win, and therefore I would win in this exchange. I'm also gonna go over what I learned doing this and what we're gonna do in the future to make everything better. Buckle up, the first thing is a CDN. ZDN is the content distribution network, or CDN backend that I use for my blog and other projects. I wrote it in Go and it runs on fly and serves terabytes of traffic per month without even blinking. It is one of my most used services next to my blog. Now, I can see some of the uh, not invented here stares in the crowd, and yes, uh, CDNs do exist. I could pay someone to do it. I was paying someone to do it, but then that company uh, made decisions that I didn't agree with, so I host my own CDN now. Just so we're on the same page, a CDN is a fancy term for a series of caching servers that are placed close to your users worldwide because the speed of light is only so fast. After that was out of the way, I needed a control API to do all, you know, the other 80% of the thing. I needed to purge files from the cache when I messed something up, I needed to list all the files in the cache, I needed to get usage metrics, and then I had to run into the authentication problem. 
I thought about using Pacetto like I do for a couple of my older internal services, and uh, then I'd have to get into key management, revocation, I uniquely identifying things, and it's, it's just a mess. But with TSNet, I was able to skip all of that and just write the service, expose it over tail scale, limit it with an ACL tag, and I'm off to the races. And because I have a separate network interface over TSNet, I could expose Prometheus metrics so that I could fuel uh, my recovering SRE habit of graphing everything in Grafana. I also use this to track the refers to let me know when I'm upvoted to the front page of Hacker News, again. <laughs> and it's a, been a wild success. It's easily been one of my most successful side projects ever, and TSNet has just made maintenance and administration effortless. Yeah, it's just a caching proxy to backblaze B2, but it's my caching proxy to backblaze B2. It does everything I need with three nodes in Trana, Seattle, and Frankfurt for like 10 bucks a month. And this was patient zero. This really made me understand how TSNet could be used to transform things instead of just as an ancillary thing. And from here, I decided to take on another challenge. A while ago, I made a patch to TSNet that allowed you to get an HTTP client that makes requests over, TSNet, over tail scale so that you could do things directly over there. And once I had that, I needed to find a way to use it. So I thought about it a while, and I decided to dig up an old project from way back in the day and modernize it with this little fun thing called Stable Diffusion. And I have a bot called RoboKD. I've been maintaining it over the years in many different forms. It was an IRC Markov chain bot. It was GPT-2 at one, some point. And right now it's stable diffusion while I wait for the AI market to come back down to earth. I don't know if it's going to. But right now this bot only has one goal in life. You feed it a prompt, it generates images. So if you tell the bot that you want, you know, like one girl that's like, blonde with brown eyes, a barista wearing an apron at a coffee machine with a smile, it'll do that. I used this web UI made by Automatic1111 to render all of the stable diffusion stuff. It handles all the Python, the linear algebra, and um, God knows what else. The only problem is that stable diffusion and this thing in general needs a GPU to run. Not a small GPU, you need a beefy gamer tier GPU. I have, I've been using an RTX 3060 to render all of the images that you've seen in this presentation so far. But, oh no, what's that? It's the pedantry zone. To be fair, yes, you don't actually need like an RTX 4090 Super or something, but it's a series of trade-offs that you have to make that are more or less convenient for the end user. I'm the end user and I get bored quick. And this would be a lot less bad if NVIDIA's per current pricing scheme wasn't big O of dollar squared, especially with the Canada tax. Either way, this bot runs in Fly. Fly doesn't have GPU nodes available yet. So I need some kind of bridge or way to connect these two worlds together. I also would really rather not punch holes into my home lab out from the internet because I don't trust myself to do it properly. However, that web UI I mentioned, that's on my tailnet. The web UI has an API that allows applications to request images based on some prompt and some other data, metadata that nerds care about. They shipped some example code with JavaScript, and I was able to port it to Go thanks to our friend ChatGPT. Then I used that HTTP client feature of TSNet that I added to query stable diffusion directly, and it was a great success. So, when the bot runs somewhere in Fly, it can hit the stable diffusion web UI over tail scale and then respond to queries within seconds. I've done some performance monitoring of it, but it looks like the longest part is the image generation step, which can only really get faster if I upgrade the GPU in that home lab node, and, you know, NVIDIA's pricing scheme has to come back down to earth. And I serve the stable diffusion web UI over tail scale so I can generate new images from anywhere, and I have a couple friends invited with no sharing. It's pretty great. And yeah, without tail scale and TSNet, I could make it, I could make it work out. I could co-locate the bot in the home lab, and then I would have to like configure that. I could run it on the same machine as the stable diffusion web UI. I could poke holes in the firewall and risk, uh, you know, my bad code getting my boxes pwned. 
but I didn't have to think about any of that because TSNet made it easy. Except for that one time when things didn't work because I told the bot to use the wrong HTTP client, you know, the one with the, hooked up to the OS network stack and not the TSNet network stack. And so things worked locally when I was testing because my dev box is on my tailnet, but it didn't work in prod, and that totally didn't make me lose a couple hours to that. No, not in the slightest. <laughs> and like before, I expose and scrape metrics over Prometheus, just like everything else. This bot is also unique because it doesn't have any public-facing HTTP ports. Tail scale is my only way into it, and it works like a charm. Speaking of Grafana, another thing we've made at work is something called Proxy2 Grafana. It is a reverse proxy that makes your Grafana server join your tailnet. When you set this up by, by following instructions written by Shay Lasso, would cool to be here from them here. <laughs> Either way, if you set this up in, in your tailnet, you get Grafana to join your tailnet like any other node, and you can connect to it by name. And then you can have Grafana be part of your tailnet. The service will be in your network, just like every other computer. Except, huh, what's that? Tailscale knows who you are. Shouldn't Grafana know who you are if you're already logged into Tailscale? Why do you need to log into Grafana in the first place? Can't it just figure it out? Why, do our services, why can't our services already know who we are instead of having to tell them who we are over and over and over and over? One of, my really fun, one of the really fun parts about my job as the Archmage is every time we come up with a new feature, I get a chance to play with it and find new and interesting ways to use it. One of my favorite of these moments was when we added funnel support to TSNet. When I really want to learn how to use something, I make something that I've made to death a billion times over, a pastebin clone. For the Zoomers in the audience, a pastebin is a website where you get a text area that you can paste text into, you hit submit, and then you get a URL so you can share it on IRC. These were really popular in the days before applications like Slack or Discord that had file uploads were popular. One of the biggest downsides of something like these, though, is that you don't own the server. Someone else hosts it, and that server can and will go away, and you will only find this out when that thing goes down and something that was load-bearing goes down with it. That was a fun thing to debug at one point. So what if you could have that self-hosted in your tailnet, and then expose those pastes out to the world with Funnel. And this is how I ended up with tclip. tclip is your private paste bin in your tailnet. Own your data, paste from the command line, the web, or even the Emacs package. And one of the really cool parts about doing this over Tailscale is, again, Tailscale knows who you are. You don't have to implement an identity layer. You don't have to implement authentication. And you can just think about writing the freaking service instead of having to focus on like things you don't care about. I've already connected to Tailscale. I've passed a two-factor auth check. I've had my machine validated through machine authorization. You can, you can attribute Tailscale, my, my IP, to my identity with a it's, it's a weak authentication factor, but it is an authentication factor. No passwords, no OAuth secrets, no YubiKey presses required. However, we didn't stop there. If you write Markdown into the box, you can activate Fancy Mode to render the Markdown into beautiful HTML. You can use this to share small drafts with your team, but then the real magic comes into play with Funnel. TClip supports sharing paste to the world with Funnel. Paste something, get the URL, and share it with people. They don't have to be on your tailnet, but it probably would be better if they're connected to the internet. Now, I see the skepticism out in the crowd. You're thinking, well, yeah, but if they do that, can't just anyone paste anything into that box and, you know, put, like, I don't know, viruses there or something? Nah, don't worry. We thought about that. When tclip sets up a funnel to the outside world, it only shares a part of that service to the public internet. The lists of all pastes and the ability to submit pastes are disabled at the type level when you're connecting over funnel. 
There is simply no way for random people to submit arbitrary data to your tclip server unless they're part of your tailnet. And if they're part of your tailnet and they're submitting malicious data, you have bigger problems. So just imagine how you could make inter your internal tools show a view of themselves to the outside world if they need to. How would that change what you make? What would it let you do that you couldn't do otherwise? How would this make your life easier? Uh, added side benefit of Tailscale, by the way, using HTTPS is so trivial, it's almost funny. It's literally like five extra lines of code in Go, and Tailscale's Let's Encrypt support takes care of acquiring the certificate, revocation, refreshing, and I don't have to think about it. It's really great. And I, I see that again, you're like, Okay, tail scale, wire guard, encryption. It's already encrypted. Why do you need to encrypt it again? Google Chrome. That's why. Google Chrome doesn't know what tail scale is, and it'll mark anything over plain HTTP over tail scale as insecure because that's kind of true, I guess. Not to mention, there's a bunch of really cool browser APIs that are locked behind HTTPS, like WebAuthn, Service Workers, and I think WebGPU. I hate computers too, don't worry. We even made a URL shortener for your tailnet that you can put at http colon double slash go. Check it out, it's called GoLink. Go Just find it on Google or DuckDuckGo or something. You can run it on fly all you want. But all roses have thorns and TSNet has some thorns too. The biggest thorn in its side is that it's a Go library and Go hasn't taken over the world yet. Don't worry, we're working on that. It's all thanks to two guys named Brian and Dennis. I can, you can stop having a heart attack without porting tail scale to C. We're just wrapping TSNet into a C library. LibTailScale is a wrapper to TSNet that exposes itself as a C library. This lets you target every tool chain on the planet so you can embed TailScale into Python, Ruby, Lua, Nim, Node, Dino, Haskell, Rust, OCaml, C Sharp, or Java. Basically, anything that can import C libraries can import tail scale thanks to this. However, we're still working on it, so it only really works the best with Python and Ruby. It's still in the early days of hacking, and it's a little bit of a side project, but here's something cool you can do with the Ruby port right now. Everywhere you go in life, you end up having a Hello World program to help you make sure that everything's working. This is an echo server in Ruby using libtailscale, and echo servers are the hello world of networking. If you run this on your tailnet, it'll create a node and it'll listen on port 1997, and if you connect it to it with netcat and paste like the B-movie script, it'll send the B-movie script back to you. And really, this is most of what you need for an HTTP server, you know, just draw the rest of the owl. Like I said though, we're working on it. If you want to take a crack at things, check out the GitHub repository. I've been poking at a Rust PR for a bit, and I'm stuck on getting Tokyo to use custom socket types. And if you know what I'm doing wrong, that would really help. So to wrap things up a bit, we've covered a lot of things today. We had the first hit of TSNet with ZDN. We had a way to transform the understanding about how networking with RoboKD. We had some innovation with Funnel, and we have a look to the future with LibTailScale. Overall, as you walk out, there are a couple things I really want to stick with you. TailScale knows who you are. Why should your services have to figure it out again constantly? Why should your services be things you access on your tailnet instead of things that are integrated into your tailnet? Why should your services outside your network need to find a way to bust their way in when they can just communicate over your tailnet and you don't have to care? And what if your internal services were part of your tailnet so that you could just natively discover them with the menulet? You can do it with TSNet. Before we finish this up, I want to take a moment to thank everybody on this list. They've been really helpful more than they know, and I'm glad I've been able to lean on you during the production of this talk. Thank you so much. And. And with that, I've been ZISO. Thanks for showing up in San Francisco. I hope you enjoy the rest of this conference. There's a lot of great talks here today, and I really want to see what you've come up with. 
I'll be up in the Ask an Engineer booth if, on the third floor if you have any questions. But if I don't get to you, please email this email address that is unique for this talk so that it'll be filed away in the right place and I will be happy to answer any questions I missed. Thank you and be well. <laughs>